everybody and welcome to, the, to today's session on professional master's programs from the Faculty of Forestry. Um, it's great to see so many of you joining us already. Um, if you haven't already, let us know where you're listening in from in the chat. It's always really great for us to see uh, where, where you are. My name is Shane Moore from the Faculty of Graduate and Postdoctoral Studies. And today we're going to cover the four professional master's programs from the Faculty of Forestry. Um, you're going to hear from program directors, program coordinators from all of those programs. And we're also going to talk about the application and admissions process. We really want to answer your questions today. Um, so if you have any questions for the panel, please post them in the Q&A. I'm going to turn the chat off shortly, but you can post your questions into the Q&A and you can also upvote questions. So if you see a question that somebody else has posted and you want to hear the answer to that one, make sure that you upvote it. We're going to answer those questions as well as the questions that you submitted as part of the registration. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we're broadcasting today from the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh nations. And as we're guests on this land, it's an honor to be able to live here, to learn and to work on these lands. And for anyone who, who didn't recognize what I was speaking there, I was just um, giving a land acknowledgement, acknowledging um, uh, the land that we're situated on today. And that's because UBC Vancouver is located on the unceded territory of the Musqueam. And the Musqueam are one of the, are one of the first nations of Canada. So I know you'll be doing lots of research right now into UBC and into the Faculty of Forestry. Um, but alongside that, I'd really encourage you, if you haven't already, to, to read more about the history of these lands, uh, particularly about the Musqueam um, on whose traditional territory UBC is located. And to get you started on that, I'll post a couple of links about the Musqueam in the chat um, in, a, in a few minutes time. Before we hear more about our professional programs, I just want to introduce you and tell you more about UBC's Faculty of Forestry. The UBC Faculty of Forestry um, is a real global leader um, in terms of forestry and natural research, resource, research, research. Um, and it's actually the lar largest faculty of forestry in Canada, and it's um, consistently ranked as one of the top three uh, forestry faculties globally. And it, it, so it's a really um, amazing place to, to, to study forestry, a really a dynamic community to, to step into. There's a real focus within the faculty um, on experiential learning opportunities, and you'll hear a lot about those today um, across our four, our four programs. Um, the facilities that we have at the Faculty of Forestry are really second to none. Um, the, the, the Forest Resource Center building, the main, the, the home of the Faculty of Forestry itself, is a wonderful um, place of learning. And you can see a picture of it in the top left of the of the screen here. Um, and, and one of the, the highlights of the building is actually actually the atrium. When you walk into the building, you actually feel like you're in a forest um, with the combination of the exposed wood um, and the, the, the glass ceiling. Um, it's a really nice place to come to and visit and study and be, be a part of. Um, beyond that, the UBC, UBC Forestry also has two research forests, uh, the Alex, Alex Frazier and Malcolm Knapp Research Forests. And that's where students can enhance their classroom learning. Um, and also a lot of research takes place, a lot of research projects take, takes place in, 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 those, uh, in those environments. Um, uh, you know, the Centre for Advanced Wood Processing is other, another facility and resource that we have within the, within the forestry faculty. Um, it's Canada's National Centre for Education, Training and Technical Assistance for Wood Products Manufacturing. Um, so another top resource that you can, you can tap into. And all of this is part of UBC. Um, UBC has a very dynamic graduate uh, student community. We have um, around 11,500 uh, graduate students at UBC Vancouver, and they're spread across uh, different programs across 11 different faculties. So not only will you be stepping into a really great community as part of your program, but also as part of the Faculty of Forestry and the wider community at UBC is a really exciting one as well. Um, so that's a little bit about the faculty and about, about UBC. And let's now uh, dive in and learn more about, um, about the four programs here. These are the four programs we're gonna learn about today. Um, and first up is the Master of Geomatics for Environmental Management. 
um, or as we know it, uh, the MGEM program. And to get us started on that, I'm gonna pass you over to Professor Nicholas Coops. Over to you. Many thanks, Shane, and welcome everyone to this webinar. It's a great pleasure to be talking to you. Uh, see you all from around the world. Uh, a great opportunity for us to talk about the program. And as Shane said, really answer those questions that you might have. So it's my pleasure to talk about the Masters for Geomatics for Environmental Management program. Uh, this program, uh, change the slide, please, uh, Shane. Uh, Shane. Uh, this program is a nine month program. Uh, we would we anticipate, well, you would start the program in August 2024. So you start this August and then you'd be finished uh, the program in April. The Masters for Geomatics for Environmental Management focuses on the use of geomatics tools. So what do we mean by geomatics? We're talking about geospatial technologies, for example, remote sensing, geographic information systems, spatial statistics, GPS, using all these different technologies to go and manage our environment in a more sustainable way. As part of the course and the program, you learn a variety of different skills, how to use these technologies, but also the theory behind them. Where have they come from? What is the current best approaches to go away? And how might you go and use those into the future? We support this with additional um, courses focused on topics like landscape ecology that give you that context for how you go and apply these technologies more broadly on your environment. If I go to the next slide, Shane, it just provides some nice examples then of the types of technologies I'm talking about using. A lot of this program is based on using these tools in a computer environment. So you can see the student there working on her laptop uh, with an external screen. In this case, she's obviously looking at geographic information like a map. So you learn programming. How do I go and get this information? And then how do I program it to go and make these useful maps and geospatial information that you might go and apply to an environmental problem. You learn R, you learn Python, you learn databases, and you learn about how to use these different image processing and GIS programs, both commercial and free and open, to apply to these particular problems that you're looking at. You also do some statistics to make sure that you're applying uh, these data and technologies in the most appropriate way. You can see the use of drones, which has become one of the most exciting ways to go and gather this information. So there's, a, there's some courses we do on remote sensing and there's a subsection of that is talking about drones. And we do go into forest and demonstrate um, how you can use these technologies in a meaningful way, making sure you're using them correctly, applying them correctly and giving you these data sets to go away and process the information. So at the end, you would be a geospatial data specialist. So most of our past graduates get jobs either with the government as a geospatial data specialist. You might choose to go and work for an NGO, a non-government organization like World Wildlife Fund. Uh, you can also go and work for private industry. We have a number of students working for consulting companies in Canada and internationally who are companies that sell these skills as they go and apply them in different ways. So in terms of job prospects, most MGEM students get a job within their first five months or six months of leaving the program. And those jobs are in these areas of geospatial data analysis, use of these data, uh, programming, uh, and, and, and applying these types of tools and technologies to the environment. So with that, um, I will pass to our uh, next one, which is Ken Byrne talking about sustainable forest management. Ken. Thank you very much, Nicholas, and uh, welcome to the web webinar, everybody. I'm really happy to be uh, introducing and talking about the Master of Sustainable Forest Management program at UBC. So it is also a nine month program. Uh, we meet first face-to-face uh, -face in August. However, you do have an opportunity to get started on some uh, pre-reading at the beginning of July. Uh, this program is accredited uh, by the Canadian Forestry Accreditation Board uh, to become an RPF in Canada and also by the Society of American Foresters in the United States to become a certified forester in the States. And um, one of the great things that I, uh, I like about the program uh, is the diversity of uh, incoming students. Um, you need to bring in a science-based, ideally a biology or ecology or environmental science-based uh, undergrad degree, although we do consider other undergrad degrees. And uh, what we supplement with is, is uh, and, it, and the program is really centered around three capstone courses uh, beginning in the summer, which provides uh, an overview of the full range of uh, forestry issues and all the complexity that comes with that, 
Uh, and then we follow that up with a site level forest land management uh, course in the fall and a landscape level forest land management course in the uh, in the winter this term. And um, additional courses, which are uh, indicated as uh, actually electives, um, unless you have a prior course in that. Oh, we've just lost Ken. <laughs> well, we're waiting for uh, Ken. There you go, okay, Ken? Yeah. Uh, Harry, do you wanna jump in? I will. So thank you, everybody. Um, my name is Harry Nelson. I am the director of the program. I work with Ken. And uh, Ken was speaking to there is, um, you know, there's very much the MSFM course, you know, we have you both out in the field because that's where forestry takes place, as well as in the classroom and on the computers. And so what Ken's describing is these three opportunities. And here are some pictures of some of these experiences of students from previous years out looking at operations, digging soil pits, understanding the ecology, understanding the operations. This year, we're gonna be out in Asuyu's in the Southern Interior with um, the Asuyu's Indian Band, looking at kind of how they're managing their forest agreements. And um, yeah, I think it's an exciting program. It's something that I think if you have a passion for the outdoors, a passion for forestry, um, there's a lot of different ways you can express it. It's not all about building roads or cutting down trees. And we have graduates, typically, I think we have like a 100% success rate with, because um, there's just been a steady demand for foresters out there. So happy to answer any questions you may have when we get to that point. And um, I see some familiar names actually on the people that have dialed in or whatever signing in. Thank you. And Thanks, I guess Harry, that, it off. that's excellent. Now I'm passing it off to Peter Wood, I believe. Thanks, Harry. Uh, thanks, everyone. Um, my name is Peter Wood, and uh, I'm a lecturer and coordinator of the Master of International Forestry Program. And uh, I lead this uh, in conjunction with Dr. Terry Sunderland here as the director. And uh, the MIF program is uh, really designed to rise to the challenge of an increasingly uh, diverse and expanding career landscape related to forests at the international level, whether it be climate change, biodiversity, conservation, uh, sustainable development, poverty reduction. Increasingly, we're seeing forests being really uh, the key to addressing many of these international challenges, but that requires cooperation. And the reason why the MIF program was invented was we saw a real need to have uh, uh, students to be uh, skilled up and ready to take on these careers that are kind of lie at the nexus between the more technical side of forestry and the field side of forestry and the policy realm, law and policy, and how do we make this uh, actually uh, connect between these two worlds. So the MIF program uh, involves uh, two terms of courses. So that's uh, you know eight months followed by an internship or directed study, uh, usually about eight to 12 weeks. Now this is designed to set uh, students up uh, for a successful career uh, beyond that. And uh, it uh, is based around, uh, around seven courses and uh, a guest lecture series uh, where we try to bring in, uh, uh, you know, our network of uh, professionals into the classroom and really keep it uh, grounded and uh, connected to current issues. We've got an incredible roster of experts within the faculty uh, that are involved in the program. And these courses uh, in turn relate to indigenous rights and indigenous led conservation, uh, community-based forest management, landscape level planning uh, for conservation and sustainable forest management, uh, international forest governance, uh, looking and comparing at how different countries are implementing international agreements. Forest business enterprise, uh, you will in, be involved in uh, kind of a dragon's den exercise in pitching uh, an international uh, forest related business. Uh, international economics and finance, looking at what the drivers of deforestation and forest degradation are and how can financial mechanisms uh, counter this. And uh, finally, environmental diplomacy, uh, looking at negotiations and conflict resolution at the international level surrounding forests. Uh, so overall, these are all focused on tangible outcomes. We want students to have something to show for their time here at the MIF program, whether that be a policy brief 
or a video, uh, a business plan. The idea is to leave with something tangible that you can be proud of. So we have the, uh, a small cohort of uh, uh, maximum 20 students, which really allows for a uh, uh, very uh, uh, close environment with uh, the cohorts bond very well academically, a lot of peer-to-peer -peer learning uh, and, and support. And uh, we regularly discuss news and recent publications and discuss how this ties in uh, with the uh, themes of the program. And uh, so it, I really encourage you to check out uh, our, our website and uh, feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Thanks. Thank you, Peter. I'll pass it over to, sorry, pass it over <laughs> no, to it's all great. Uh, Dr. Just Sarah Barron, who will <laughs> talk about uh, Muffle. Thanks. Yeah, so I'm Sarah Barron. I'm a lecturer and I'm the program director for our new uh, Masters of Urban Forestry Leadership Program. Uh, and this is for students who are passionate about trees and green spaces um, and how they connect to people living in cities. Um, so our program, because it's very international in scope and focus, is online. Uh, we've had students from Australia, we've had students from Europe, from the United States participating in the program. Um, we are looking at people who've been working in urban forestry, maybe without uh, having an opportunity to have education in urban forestry because it's a new profession, or students who are looking to change careers. Um, so a lot of our students are professionals and mature, and so we have an online program where you can study while working, um, and that's our 25-month part-time program, or a 13-month full-time program where you can focus for that year on your studies. And we cover the breadth of skills needed to become a professional urban forester. Um, what does that mean? Well, we talk about urban forest governance. We talk a little bit about geomatics skills, uh, leaning on uh, some of the professors who are working in the Masters of Geomatics program. Uh, we do urban forest benefits and resources assessment, everything from how to do a tree inventory to how to assess your own piece of the urban forest as the project students do. Uh, we learn about the latest in arboriculture practices, urban ecology. Uh, we learn a lot from international best practice. One of the benefits of being online is that we have the world leaders in urban forestry come to class and give personalized lectures to our students with lots of opportunity to have discussions with folks from Australia, from Europe, from the United States who are on the leading edge of urban forestry. And all of this is um, rounded off with a capstone project where students are supported to explore in depth a topic of interest to them. Anything from you know, doing a survey to measuring trees locally. Uh, we've got a student right now looking to expand our region's climate adaptive species list for planting in urban areas. Uh, we find mentors and we support students to do something of interest to them for about a third of the program. We're online, um, but we do have an opportunity to meet in person. Uh, so here's some images of us exploring urban forests in Europe. Uh, we have one week optional field experience in Europe. First year we went to Italy. Some of these pictures are from there. My background is in, in my Zoom background right now is uh, a picture I took on Bosco Verticale in Milan where we met with the architects to learn about the challenges and opportunities in this type of urban infrastructure. This year, we're going to Malmo and Copenhagen to talk with professionals there about some really leading edge work they're doing in tree species diversity planting, amongst other things. Um, so we do have these opportunities to meet with each other. The students are all very socially connected, even though they're online. Uh, it's been pretty amazing to watch that happen. Our graduating students have gone on to careers in local government in leadership positions in uh, federal government leadership positions uh, and some provincial and regional government positions in things like environmental planning, uh, urban forest management, urban forest policies. I think two students are sort of running their own urban forest departments in sort of medium-sized municipalities right now. Um, so there's a lot of careers out there. Um, the Society of American Forests just two weeks ago has announced a new professional credential in urban forestry that we're uh, preparing our students to be able to meet. 
uh, as that rolls out into the future. So it's a very exciting time to study urban forestry. Uh, and our program is uh, dedicated to making sure that you're well prepared to work in the field. I'm going to pass it on to Lee now to give you some information about how to apply for our programs. Thank you, Sarah. Hi, everyone. My name is Lee Yupiten. I'm one of the admissions coordinator for our professional master's programs. And uh, if we can get to the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so the deadline for our program application is actually approaching. It's February 15th. And uh, just to give you an understanding, depending on which program you're applying for, uh, there are specific backgrounds they're looking for. But generally, I've seen um, students apply from various backgrounds. So um, even a geography and arts, mathematics, computer science program, um, not necessarily forestry. Um, so we are welcoming students from any academic program to apply. Um, and for prerequisites, I would encourage you to look at the specific program pages to see what the um, prerequisites are. Uh, for example, MGEM is looking for students with at least an introductory course in statistics, and MSFM is looking for students who have some science courses or in their undergrad. Um, for GPA, we are looking for an average of a B plus. That's the minimum requirement. Um, and that is for your senior level courses, 300 and 400 level, if you're applying from the States and Canada. If you're applying from an international um, country, the overall degree is actually what we're looking at for to determine your GPA and depending on the country's uh, minimum requirements. And there is a link on our admissions webpage that you can click on and look up by the country and you can see what the minimum average is. The English language proficiency is also something that we require for students applying from outside of um, North America. And if your school did conduct um, the entire uh, program in English, you can provide a letter uh, from the university to uh, let us know, and you may be eligible for an exemption for the language proficiency test. However, if you need to do that language test, we do require a minimum score, and you can find all that information on our admissions webpage. Next, please. The application is an online application, and there's an application fee associated with that. And we do require three, uh, three letters of references. One, at least, is an academic reference. Um, we also require official copies of the transcripts from all schools that you have attended. So this includes uh, a course that you may have taken when you were in an exchange somewhere in the summer. We do require copies of that transcript as well. So you would upload that transcript with your application. We also require um, a questionnaire. There's a program questionnaire that's built in the online application and a letter of intent. So why you're interested in studying in this particular program and also a CV uh, and as mentioned, possibly an English test if needed. Next, please. And if you have any further questions, feel free to contact our office. Our website is forestry.cbm at ubc.ca. We do have um, weekly Zoom advising sessions. Uh, so if you go to our webpage, you can con connect with us. There's a link to make an appointment to talk to one of our, um, to talk to myself or my colleague. And um, we wish you all the best. And if you have any questions, like I said, we will respond to your emails um, usually within a day. Thanks, and uh, Lee. we will, I'll pass it on to Shane for the Q&A. Thanks. Thanks, Lee. Thanks for all that great information. And uh, thanks to all of our panelists. That was a great overview of, of these four programs. Um, now it's time uh, for the Q&A. Um, so we're going to answer your questions. So do you feel free to keep posting questions in the q and I know some of them have been answered already. Um, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen here so you can see everybody more easily. OK. Um, so let's let's begin um, with a question that we had posted as part of the as part of the reg registration. Um, I know there's a, there's a question. I know this is important for for people across uh, three of these programs, at least in terms of the on campus housing situation. So we did get a question in um, asking what the on campus housing situation looks like, um, considering the start and end dates for the MSFM program. 
Um, are there certain residences that are recommended for graduate students in forestry, or does it just ta just come down to personal uh, pr preference? Um, Ken, do you want to speak to this? Because I know you had some information. Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, and sorry about the technical glitch. My uh, power went out, so it took a while for the Wi-Fi to get back. Um, so yeah, the uh, housing, we recommend um, that you apply even before you um, to housing, even before you apply to the program, because that ensures that you get on that wait list. Um, there were some issues a couple of years ago with uh, finding accommodation and uh, what UBC Housing has uh, generously done is uh, provide priority to uh, especially the uh, short term uh, professional master's program because you're only here for a short time. Uh, they've extended priority for housing, but it's still a good idea to apply for that housing as early as possible um, to ensure that you get a spot. It usually starts um, in September. Uh, that's when the housing starts, and that's often when our, our often when our students arrive. There is early to mid August, so many of them are just staying somewhere temporarily. You do spend uh, a, a week at uh, right, right before uh, the Labor Day weekend out in the fields. So it would only be the uh, week that you're at UBC that you would have to find something temporary in roughly the middle of August. That's great. Thank, thanks, Ken. Um, the, the key things, if I can just add, is, as Ken said, you know, apply early. So you can actually apply for campus housing even before you've submitted your application to UBC. Um, and if you're not successful with campus housing or if you prefer to live off campus, there's some really great options. And once you're admitted to UBC um, through the Faculty of Graduate Studies, you'll actually be given much more information about, about housing in Vancouver. And also we can connect you with other incoming graduate students who are looking for housing. So you might find shared accommodation. Um, we have an, an in-house message, message board um, called Community where you can connect with others who have spare rooms or have, a, ha, ha, have space. Um, so yeah, key thing is, apply early and give yourself time to find housing but you know it, it, it shouldn't be a problem um and as, and as Ken said there is priority um you know for, the, for those forestry students okay um a, a, a question here that came in as part of the registration from Kate who asks um do these master's programs cross over in their teaching cohorts um, and do placement opportunities sig differ significantly significantly between the, diff the different programs? Um, so if the panel would be willing to speak about if there's any sort of cross uh, pollination around around teaching cohorts and how the, how are the placements are, are they big, are, are there big differences between each program? Would anyone want to get started on that? I could maybe get started. Um, it Please. is uh, to answer that question, it is work in progress. Uh, starting uh, next year, I believe, we have uh, a couple of uh, common courses uh, called core courses that all professional master's uh, programs uh, will be taking uh, together. It represents uh, a minority of that course load. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, among the coordinators, we do try and set up uh, opportunities um, for both social and technical uh, sharing and to answer to follow up on Ken's question, I, I do see differences between the programs and sort of their emphasis. I mean, from my perspective for the MSFM program, this is very much an out in the field. So be comfortable being outdoors. You know, we're trying to equip you. I mean, you can go end up working in an office. You may end up working out in the field, whatever. But that's very much a um, built both into the program, the courses, and the delivery. Um, I my my sense of it, and I would kind of in talking with the other program coordinators and directors, is we're definitely out there more than they are. Even though I know field trips are an active component of what you other go, what you do as well. Yeah, and in in terms of placement. I mean, I, I would say it differs depending on, it differs uh, from year to year. And I would imagine between the programs based on the um, the qualities of the applicants that uh, present themselves at, at application time. So uh, I think each of the uh, coordinators and directors go through uh, an independent process of evaluating candidates. 
I might just jump in here and, and say that I see uh, quite a bit of uh, overlap, kind of like a Venn diagram, uh, where we've got a lot of complementarities between the programs. Uh, for example, you know, we may discuss urban forestry, uh, but it's in the context of, you know, how does an urban environment deliver on some of our international obligations under climate or biodiversity treaties? Um, you know, we may address issues around, uh, uh, you know, sustainable forest management, but sometimes that's in a comparative international context. How are different countries handling different challenges associated with SFM? And how does uh, forestry help deliver on some of those international commitments? Uh, so we get together for uh, social events uh, from time to time, uh, where I really enjoy comparing notes and, and sort of cross pollination. Um, and uh, we really have a, a quite a, a nice uh, uh, sort of sharing of expertise uh, between programs. That's great to hear. Thanks, everyone. Um, another another question that was uh, submitted as part of the registration from Olivia. Um, Olivia has worked as a tree planter and also a wildlife firefighter. Um, they hold a, a, a Bachelor of Science and they're interested in potential pathways to becoming a forestry technician or a professional forest, forester. Um, but Olivia is wondering, what, what are the benefits of a professional core space masters, such as the ones that we've talked about today, compared to a research-based masters, which might take a couple of years, because we do have a research-based masters as well. Um, what would be um, some of the advantages or differences um, considering her, her career goals? Um, Olivia, maybe I'll answer that because I both supervise graduate students and being the director. I think this actually comes back to what are your career goals? You know, do you see yourself, um, you know, if you want to become a professional forester, and that's something that's important to kind of progression, I guess, through the ministry or in whatever way, um, the professional master's program makes sense to do that. I mean, and I will say that we've had a lot of tree planters, we've had a lot of firefighters, and indeed this year we've got both in the program. I think if forest, if you don't want to become necessarily become a professional forester, um, then the master's option becomes something I guess increasingly people see as a maybe a necessary qualification, qualification, kind of work in forestry or related field. Uh, that will be um, take longer, as Shane mentioned. You know, typically it's supposed to be two years, but most master's students are three to four years. And part of that will be just there's some challenges sometimes um, finding the funding because, you know, to take on a master's students, we typically have to be able to identify kind of how they're going to be funded. So it's, you know, if you're going in the RPF route, it's short and sweet, I guess, in a way, going through a professional master's program. But, you know, a master's program may take you there, but it's going to take a bit longer and sort of depends where you want to end up. Can I just add to that? Yeah. Um, yeah. Essentially, um, we, we have two two types of cohort in the MIF, and those are focused on research and those focused on more professional uh, applications of, of international forestry. Um, and those who have done, who are focused on research, have often gone on to do masters or PhDs. Um, and it hasn't sort of been an either or option. It's, it's sort of a, a route from one to the other, if that makes sense. Um, but what many of the master's programs, particularly the MIF, is, was focused on mid-career professionals who want to change careers and focus on something else. You know, we've had graduates in gerontology, the study of old age, and um, Russian history, and English literature, and all kinds of in interesting stuff. Um, and they've gone on to do professional forestry in their careers. And we've also had people who've focused on on research. So it's 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 kind of as Harry said, it's, it's what the individual student uh, or candidate wants to do uh, in the future. Whether they want to focus on research, and then obviously masters by research is, is the route to go. If you want to change your career or, 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 or shore up your, your experience in international forestry, urban forestry, geomatics, whatever it might be, then the professional masters, master's courses are, are the best route to go. Great. Thanks for that. Thanks for the, that, that um, explanation. That's really, really helpful. Um, okay, so just switching over now, there's a question that came in from Angela about the MSFM program. Um, a couple of questions here. Angela's just wondering, how are the elective classes um, 
determined. So how how can students enroll enroll into the elective classes? How how can they choose uh, them? And also, um, they're wondering where will the field tour course be held in twenty twenty four? Um, if if we know that yet, I think sure, I can that. take that. Yeah, I'd be happy. I'd be happy to answer that. Um, as indicated on the website, the, there are quite a few courses that are indicated as electives. For example, uh, I think uh, the economics is the policy, and it's only an elective if you have actually had a economics or policy or a, in the case of GIS, a GIS course before. So you would have to negotiate with the instructor on a waiver of that course if you have taken some prior. Then you have an extra elective. And in actual effective fact, um, there's really only room for one elective in the program. Usually that's taken in the second term when there's more time. And you can select from courses in the calendar. We have a number of courses related to forest operations, growth and yield, uh, indigenous studies. Um, and if you can't find something that is uh, of interest for you in the uh, uh, set courses, uh, we do also offer a directed study where you can do something hands-on and um, in fact, in this year's cohort, I have more directed studies. Uh, I have 13 students doing directed studies out of 19 and the rest are doing set courses. So this is a great opportunity to get some hands-on experience with professionals in the field. Um, regarding the field, we actually have uh, significant field components in every single course uh, in the capstone courses in the summer, the fall and the winter. So every summer we do spend one week in Nelson, which is in Southeast BC in the Kootenays. Um, really nice area to uh, get exposure to professionals in government, industry and manufacturing. And in the fall, we have uh, a number of day trips to community forests uh, and also the research forest out in Maple Ridge, uh, where we do our site plan. And then in the and that's always in in Maple Ridge for the site plan. And then in the winter term, in the landscape level course, we select from a number of different community forests, preferably one that has a strong connection with First Nations. And that varies from year to year. This year, we're going to uh, West Boundary Community Forest and Asoyas Indian Band in the Southern Interior. Um, next year, uh, we're setting up agreements to go up to uh, Pemberton uh, to work with the community forest and the Little Rock First Nation. Thanks, thanks for those answers. That's really, really helpful. Um, let's tackle um, Max's question that's just just been posted in the Q and A. Uh, there's a, there's four parts to this one, but let's uh, let's work through this if if, if we can. Um, just the first part of Max's question, and if we could expand this to all of our all of our programs, you know, Max is asking, are there any tips for having a strong application uh, for these programs, particularly the MGEM? But if we could quickly kind of run through each program. Um, Let's start with the MGEM, if that's okay, um, and then we can go, go from there. What, what are some tips for having a strong application? So all of our applications require a cover letter, uh, and some have questionnaires as well. The key thing for all of us is that you're passionate and dedicated about the topic that you're coming to study. So we'd, I, I'd want to hear in a geomatics case that you have always been you know, your interest in geospatial science, how you think that geospatial science will improve your career opportunities moving forward and why you feel passionate about coming and spending nine months at UBC and working with us on that topic. So I'm looking for evidence of passion, for interest in the topic, for some idea about how you think it's gonna improve your career as you then go and move forward and get other jobs. And that real uh, commitment to that topic that you're that you committed to coming to do that at UBC for nine months. So it's that, it's that passion around the topic that I think all of us are looking for for our individual programs that really pushes you above other people. If you just simply said, I wanna do any professional program at UBC, then obviously that isn't really showing me that you're focused and passionate about geomatics. So you need to really tailor your application to the professional program you're interested in and really highlight to us why, why you wanna go and do that program, why you wanna come and join us. And to me, that's the most critical thing about building that strong application. Shane. Great. Sarah, do you wanna jump in? Yeah, I'll echo what Nicholas said. We have a lot of students sort of anxious about applying for urban forestry because they don't have a background in urban forestry. That's less important to us, that background. What's really important is that passion for urban forestry. 
knowing why you want to do a few specific details about what drew you to, in our case, urban forestry, and as Nicholas said, what you think you're going to do in the future with that topic. So don't be anxious if you don't have that background. It's really about looking to the future and what, what the program will do for your career. I'll pass it on to the others now. I'm happy to jump in. Uh, similar to uh, the other programs, you know, looking for that that motivation is key. Uh, past, present, future is a helpful way to break it down. Uh, a little bit about where you're coming from, uh, the motivation to start the program, uh, anything in particular. Be specific about things that you are, uh, uh, are are looking at that you you find appealing. It helps to reference you know specific things so we know you might have actually seen the website uh, or if you have any uh, particular topics you're interested in, and then the future. So looking for, you know, after this program, what are you looking to 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 move on towards? And that just really helps us uh, get a little bit uh, uh, more uh, focused on what particular motivations and interests you have uh, in the program. And then uh, show off a bit, highlight uh, if there's, you know, specific things that you have accomplished that you want to draw our attention to amongst a, a, a long uh, a CV, if there's something in particular we should not uh, fail to to uh, to see. Uh, yeah, thanks. And did you want to jump in? I think you pretty much covered it off. One thing I think that I would add from that Ken and I look at, um, Nicholas spoke to that letter of intent is really important. So spend some time on that. And the other thing, again, given the background of the MSFM program, I think it was Olivia was talking about her background and experience. That counts for a lot for us. You know, so for us, given where people may be going, that's a valuable something, an important part of your, you know, experience and something that's worth highlighting as well, too, if that's something you're bringing to it. But you don't have to have that. I just want to emphasize that, too. Great. And then, um, uh, Shane, I can continue if Max's questions. Um, yes. The one about the work possibilities, you know, these are really intensive programs. All four, well, the three of them that are in person, I'll let Sarah speak to Muffle, slightly different. But for the other three, we're in person. We're in person here at UBC on the Vancouver campus, and you're working hard. You've got nine months to go away and do these programs. So we don't recommend that you have outside jobs. Uh, it's very difficult to maintain a job and do the program at the same time. Uh, in all cases, we're expecting, you know, 100% dedication. We're fair uh, around what we expect. But, you know, it, it really is an intensive program to get you out in that period of time. So we appreciate it costs money to do the program, but we really think, you know, you should be prepared uh, to come and do that program 100%. And um, having a, a job on the side for that nine months is going to make it very difficult for you to give the attention that you need to the program. So a real caution about trying to work at the same time. In terms of in internships and co-op, not for MGEM. So we don't have internships or co-op programs, but the other programs um, do have different models of that um, internships, for example. So if you've got specific questions about internships for MIF, for example, then please reach out to those, um, to Peter or Terry and they can, and Lee, and they can direct you for that. Uh, and then the, the programs that are at UBC in person, yes, we have scheduled, rigid programs. There are classes at certain times. Uh, there are lab sessions at certain times that faculty come and teach. So you have a calendar and a timetable that you essentially follow uh, through the two terms that you're here. So it's not flexible in that sense. You need to attend the classes when they're on. Uh, they're, I don't like the term rigid, but they are, they are formalized in the sense of, of what we teach and when. Now, muffle is slightly different. So Sarah, I'll pass that to you for the muffle. Yeah, so our full-time program being 13 months, it's very difficult to have a job and we highly don't recommend it. Um, it's too stressful for the students, which is why uh, we we created the part-time program, which has just been in place for five months now and students do have the opportunity to study while they're at their job. They have to reduce their hours at work though to continue studying, um, but they are able to study over two years. Um, you can't expect to get a master's in a year and work. It's just simply too much work and it would sort of degrade the quality of the program if we allowed for too much flexibility. So our program, the 13 month students, we ask not to work and a lot of people take that year off of work uh, to invest in their future careers. And then the part-time students, as I said, they can work, although not at full-time hours generally. 
we do have an internship opportunity as an option for the capstone project as well. And uh, maybe that's a good segue into the MIF program, talking about some of their opportunities. Sure. Hello, can you, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah within the, uh, the MIF program, uh, you know, Similarly, we uh, discourage having uh, work outside of uh, the, the program. Typically, we have an intensive uh, morning session of classes followed by an afternoon uh, where students are often working together in small groups, whether it be uh, preparing for preparations or, or group work uh, or the readings. So uh, that tends to continue through the, uh, the eight months of classes and then the uh, uh, internship and directed studies uh, similarly, is an intensive uh, eight to twelve week uh, period uh, where uh, students are either embedded within an international organization uh, doing work, uh, and, or they are uh, paired with uh, uh, faculty and undertaking uh, directed study. Great. Would anyone else like to jump in on this one in terms of internship and co-op opportunities? Great. Um, let's see. Okay, we've got another question here in the in the Q and A. Um, if someone like myself who has an industry and government forestry experience and an RPF but wants to pursue research and gain more experience with mapping and modelling, um, would it be beneficial to take the MSFM um, or the Masters of Science in Forestry? Maybe I, I can answer that. Uh, since I've done both a, a master's of uh, science and forestry as a grad student, as a research grad student, and as a uh, coordinator in the MSFM, uh, you do have, uh, I think, as an RPF uh, or as somebody who wants to progress towards an RPF, it is a faster track uh, towards uh, that designation. You also do get um, a broad range of um, opportunities to model both uh, spatially with GIS and also with um, uh, forest landscape models such as uh, patchworks and stand level models. So you get the full range of work with models. Uh, I think with uh, research um, uh, graduate uh, studies, uh, you may get a very uh, focused area of, of modeling and it may not cover the full spectrum of what's required to become a um, a registered professional forester. We it is not unheard of if you do still have like a lot of research, uh, I guess interests. There is some limited opportunity to achieve that within the directed studies, and it's also not uh, unprecedented for graduates of the MSFM program to go on and do a research uh, PhD degree. It is the exception, but if you do have uh, strong research interests that you want to apply these tools that we teach you in the MSFM program. Uh, that can be a conversation you can have during the program. Well, Harry, I think you're muted. Ken, just to clarify, my understanding is the student, the candidate asking the question does have an RPF degree. Oh, so I, my me. advice to you would be a master's then. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I, yeah. So. That's great. Yeah, th thanks everyone. Um, there was actually a question that came in as part of the registration, um, just asking about what the process is in terms of obtaining an RPF license post-graduation. Is that something we could just touch on briefly? Would anyone be able to jump in on that? What, what's the process for gaining an RPF license after graduation? Sure, I can do that. And uh, I don't know if it was mentioned earlier, but um, if you apply to the Forest Professionals of BC, uh, which is the professional association that manages the uh, credit of the RPF in BC, uh, you do get credit for your time in the program. So your nine months, if assuming you register right at the beginning of the program, your nine months in the program counts towards your work experience. You do need two years of work experience uh, post-graduation or in combination of your time in the program plus experience after you graduate. And then uh, you initially registered as a allied science FIT. And then once uh, we send your transcripts to the professional association after graduation, you convert to uh, a forester in training, a full FIT. Um, once you're in that stream, you go through a series of uh, six modules, which in, is a combination of uh, assignments and tests on a range of forestry topics and policy, especially. 
And uh, after you've completed that six module, then you are an RPI. It usually takes, the process usually takes roughly two to three years after graduation, depending on how much experience you have. Great, thanks, Ken. Excellent. Um, another question that we had in as part of the registration from Eva um, was about the, the types of, of, of jobs that graduates would go into straight after each, each programme. Um, do you see more people going into more office type work or is it more field work or a mix, mixture of both? Um, so I'm just wondering if each, you, if each, you, each of you sorry, could, could speak briefly to what graduates go into after, after the programme. I know we've touched on it already, but if you could, if you could um, talk a bit more about that. And also, I know this came up earlier, like connections with alumni, like how, how can students um, and graduates tap in with the alumni community for your programmes? Would anyone want to speak to that? Sarah? Uh, we've just recently published some questions and answers with recent graduates, uh, so I encourage you to look at our website and look through Hendry and Robert's testimonials. Um, if you're interested, I'm sarah.baron at ubc.ca, happy to connect you with um, some alumni from the program if you want to have more detailed questions about what students learn. Uh, as I said earlier, we've had students go into leadership positions in local government, primarily environmental planners, urban forest managers, writing urban forest strategies for communities. Uh, one student used the skills gained in the program to really elevate their business and expand their business practices. Um, and others are, yeah, doing their own consultancy firms. Um, so those are some of the, the graduate job pathways from the Masters of Urban Forestry Leadership Program. Harry's got his hand up, so I'll pass it over to him. I think and I can add to this too, but we have people working for First Nations. We have people working leadership positions with the provincial government around different aspects of policy. Um, most of our graduates, I would say, end up probably about 90% within Canada. We do have some that kind of work overseas or work down in the States, which I guess consider, is considered international. Um, it's really a mix. I mean, I think the flexibility with students that come through our program, you know, if they want to go work out in the field, that's where they're going to go. There's plenty of opportunities there. At the same time, if they want to go work in an office setting, that's, you know, that exists as well, too. And I think Ken and I are both happy to, I mean, there is a very well-developed each class, and I think this would be true of all the other programs. There's a lot, there's a lot of camaraderie that exists within these cohorts. And they also have a lot of pride in the programs they've taken. So they're always happy to talk with you about their experience. We're happy to put you in touch. And if you sort of give us some idea of what things you want to, you know, we can point you to somebody working up in Squamish, somebody working in Victoria, the provincial capital, or somebody working down in the States. Happy always to do that. Uh, I can jump in here and say that uh, for the International Forestry Master's Program, uh, we actually have a mixture of students that uh, go on to work internationally and then students uh, that work locally, but on international issues or, or issues that cross over. Uh, so for example, uh, you know, one of our, our grads, uh, uh, Stephanie Lee, has gone on to be the, uh, the lead for bioeconomy for the Ministry of Forests here in BC. So that's a domestic position with international implications. Uh, we've got grads that have gone on to work for First Nations and, and looking at uh, uh, some issues around, uh, you know, climate, biodiversity, and other sort of transboundary issues. And, um, you know, overall, we love staying in touch with our alumni. We often have them back in class, and that really inspires the, the current cohort to see what they can go on to do. I encourage you to go to our LinkedIn page. Uh, we've got a video up there right now from one of our recent grads talking about uh, what it's like to, to go on to uh, work in the field. Uh, and uh, yeah, please connect uh, uh, via LinkedIn, and you'll be uh, included within other updates uh, where we do other video profiles of alumni. Thanks. Did you want to jump in? 
Uh, yes, I just wanted to add um, that for MGEM, I know that Kathleen, our MGEM coordinator, has also invited uh, alumni from the program to come and speak to the students um, every year on different topics and workshops. And we also have a uh, MGEM uh, networking event where we invite industry to come and also uh, showcase and give some tips and advice on our on our current students on how to land you know their first job um, in the industry and some of those people who come back could be um, alumni from the program as well, um, maybe from other programs besides MGEM. Um, I know we've had students who end up working for um, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans um, from the MGEM cohort, and uh, they seem to uh, like our students, and sometimes they refer each other when there's a job opportunity. They'll send me a posting and say, can you please share this with the, the cohort? So there's, a, there's opportunity to definitely network with people who are in the industry. Thanks, Shane. If I, if I could add to that too, I mean, there's uh, the MSFM program has been around since uh, uh, 2012. So over 10 years of uh, alumni out there in the field. Uh, it's a strong network. Uh, many alumni have moved into very high level, high profile positions, and they do recognize the value of the MSFM program. And there is a strong preference uh, from our alumni and others uh, for that matter, uh, who value the uh, maturity and the experience that um, uh, students come out of the program with. Brilliant. It's so great to hear about this community and, and so great to hear that alumni are still so closely connected and come in and speak and connect with, with current students. That's amazing. Um, Excellent. Okay, so we've just got a couple of minutes to go now. Um, I think we've answered all of the questions in the Q and A, which which is great. Thank you to the panelists for for, for doing that. Um, maybe to wrap up, I can just pose a question to to the group. Um, everyone listening today, and um, will hopefully be be joining uh, soon, jo starting grad school soon over the next year or two. What advice would you have from for, for making the step up into grad school? Obviously, it's going to be different from their previous academic experience, what advice would you have on making a strong start and making the most of your of your time um, at, at grad school? Would anyone want to get us started on that? Sure, I could start. Um, time management. Uh, work on your time management skills. Uh, everything comes really uh, fast and quick, and there's a lot of information to go through. Um, it's... Uh, I mean, really what we're trying to train here, you know, they're professional degrees. So we're tra training you to be a professional in the industry and what the expectations are. And, and in, uh, as a professional forester, uh, that's, you know, eight, 10 hour days time in the field and uh, a commitment to the profession. So come ready to work hard. It is short. And one of the benefits of the shorter program, even though it's more expensive, there's uh, an opportunity cost that you pay with a longer degree that you don't have to with the uh, shorter professional program. So um, yeah, just uh, come uh, uh, full of energy and passion and uh, ready to put in full days for uh, for nine months. I might just uh, hot pursuit on Ken's uh, uh, points there because I, I absolutely agree. It's this change in mindset from being a student to almost a, as a colleague, a colleague amongst your your peers within the cohort. Uh, a colleague to the the other instructors in that professional context. Uh, and so really thinking about how you are rising to that level uh, and um, enriching the, uh, the the conversation, not uh, reactive to the course requirements, but kind of proactive, seeking out opportunities, seeking out, uh, you know, things that are in current events that, uh, that you're bringing into the classroom and discussing, seeking out new research and sharing it. Um, so I think that's a, the main uh, change for, for me, I think, from from undergraduate uh, to to uh, master's level is that um, uh, that level of professionalism and collegiality uh, and sort of proactiveness uh, that goes beyond the bare minimum to really pushing uh, the limits of what you can get out of the program and how you can deliver value uh, to the rest of the classroom. Thanks. I'm jumping on what Peter said. Um, 
that early investment in in building your cohort and those social connections as well as those academic connections with each other the earlier you spend time getting to know each other and helping each other out we build these very strong and collegial groups of students in all four of our programs they're going to be your colleagues for life really uh, i see it even two years later there's lots of activity between the students and so early investment just helps you in those times when classes might be a little bit overwhelming, you've got this support network built in already. Yeah, and I couldn't agree more with my colleagues. Well done. <laughs> then, great. Um, well, we're at 10.29 here, so I think we'll, we'll wrap things up for today. Thank you to all of the panellists. Thanks so much for your time and, and insight. It's been really great. Thanks to everyone at home for posting questions. I hope that this session was helpful. Um, we are going to follow up shortly uh, with an email um, and um, we hope that you'll you'll apply soon. Um, and do, please be in touch if you have any, any, any more questions. Um, but I'll say thanks everyone for today. Um, and if anyone wants to jump in and say any final words, please feel free to do so. Thanks all. Otherwise, otherwise we'll say thanks and uh, goodbye for now. We'll see you soon. Thank you, yeah. everybody. Thank you.